up there. We're going to hold Q&A until the very end of the presentations and we would just ask that you type your questions into the chat box at the bottom and uh, Debbie and myself will moderate that and read them out to the presenters. Um, also, they do, I know at the end of their PowerPoint, they have an information slide on how to contact them should you need anything following the presentation. Um, so for now, I'm going to let um, Nelly pop up their PowerPoint and turn it over to Sanjay, who's going to be uh, leading the presentation. Thank you very much. Appreciate being here. So um, today, I think we have an interesting presentation for you. Uh, regarding COVID-19 and, and challenges uh, presented to municipalities and what are some of the unique solutions that we can bring to bear against that. Uh, I would say that that some of these solutions and some of these problems, they're, they're things that municipalities have been dealing with for a long time, but COVID-19 just brings an acuteness to it. Uh, and so uh, why don't we move to first our, our panel and just start moving on it. So actually, we're going to move through, and as people on the team speak, they'll do a larger introduction. But we have Nicole DeVoe, National Leader Human Capital Management. Nicole has a broad background in, in consulting, public and, and, and private sector work. So uh, she'll bring a lot to it. And Ricky Sony, who has been concentrated in public sector work and has done work with municipalities, CNPOs, utilities. And um, they'll give a more expanded background. Myself, I came to municipality work through private sector. I was with a large technology company for eight years, and we implemented uh, technology transformation for cities in Canada, the United States, England, uh, Australia, and Europe. Uh, we also went through the uh, 2008 downturn and the crash, and that was an interesting period as well, and had some insights on sort of where you see municipalities challenged. I think we have a very interesting agenda, and so if we move to that, um, Besides our introduction, we're gonna have just a, kind of a framing of the current challenge facing municipalities. And that'll lead into where Nicole will overview some of the concerns specific to Nova Scotia. That should be very interesting. And then we have three case studies. And after, to leave you with some takeaways, we'll, we'll provide some practical tips and some sense of uh, how to bucket some of the solution areas that you might wanna look at or consider uh, that you might have up on the wall and think about, well, you know, what am I doing to tackle these problems? as we go through the 19 and long-term plan for getting through it. With that, I think I'll just uh, turn it over to Nicole. Uh, thanks, Sanjay. Uh, so good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Sanjay mentioned, my name is Nicole DeVoe. Uh, I'm based here in our Halifax office uh, of Grant Thornton. Uh, and I started with Grant Thornton originally in 2008. And prior to that, I actually worked as a consultant within the public sector. Um, so we thought we'd just start out by giving you a brief overview for those of you who may not know uh, who Grant Thornton is. Um, just before we get into the meat of today's discussion. So Grant Thornton is a leading Canadian accounting and advisory firm providing audit tax and advisory services to both public and private organizations for more than 70 years across the country. Together with our partners in Quebec, uh, Grant Thornton has more than 5,000 people in 135 offices across the country. And we're also a member of Grant Thornton International where we operate in over 130 countries worldwide. From an Atlantic or Nova Scotia perspective, uh, we like to think that we offer the best of both worlds, a bit of a global outlook, given our international and national network, uh, on what's important, plus uh, experiences, insight, and insights from our local markets. In Atlantic Canada, we have nearly 600 uh, employees and 76 partners and principals uh, working with leaders um, in a variety of sectors across 28 locations in the region. Uh, we've been in Atlanta, Canada for over 80 years, and in Nova Scotia, we've got offices from Yarmouth to Sydney and almost every point in between, operating out of 10 offices. Fundamental to our culture and our DNA as a professional services firm is that we live and work in the communities that we serve. This means, and we like to think that it gives uh, our clients the benefit of building relationships with local advisors that are actually present in their community who then also can leverage experts from across the country. We have really an objective of being a true business advisor where we get to know our clients, their business, and what we can do to help them succeed. And a huge part of getting to know them is living and working in the communities that we serve. 
many of you on this call today may actually know us. Um, we work with many municipalities across the province uh, because the public sector is really a primary area of focus for our firm in Nova Scotia. In Atlantic Canada, our public sector group is represented by more than 25 senior advisors who collaborate regularly to help organizations like many of you um, to address a variety of opportunity and challenges inherent in your sector. Uh, this really, we think, gives us a, a depth of understanding of the municipal landscape, which ultimately adds value to any project that we undertake with clients in this sector. Sanjay, back to you. Great. So the current challenges facing municipalities, how do we, how do we frame that? So again, with our, our sector and group, we tried to simplify the problem, which is really about this slide. So right now, municipalities in, in Atlantic, but across the world, the need for those vital services is greater than ever. Uh, whether it's emergency support services, road repair, there's just a ton of services, even for the indigent, like your poor in the community that right now going through COVID-19, they're, they're looking for that municipal leadership and they rely on some of those services. But revenue sources have plummeted. Broadly speaking, whether it's transit fees, parking fees, user fees, um, concerns about non-payment of property taxes, revenue sources have, have plummeted. So when you, when you look at that uh, in total, it, it's you, you need more services, you have less money. So how do you still deliver a high quality of services and, and, and meet that demand, knowing full well that, that uh, revenues are down? We tried to look at some impact to, uh, to, to kind of quantify the problem. So on this next slide here, we, we pulled some Atlantic numbers. Halifax estimating a revenue loss of $44 million, 2020, 2021. Amherst, Nova Scotia could lose between $200,000 and $400,000. St. John's is forecasting a deficit of $18 million by year's end. Cape Breton Transit, so a transit authority losing $120K per month. And then Village of Baddock, it's considering disillusion because of the loss of tourism revenue. Now, one thing as well as people might say, well, you know, how does it impact the services? Well, typically 80% of the money collected goes towards services, operations, maintenance. So it's, it's a huge amount, less than 20% goes towards infrastructure. So it's a powerful problem to deliver great services. So moving on then to the next slide. The question they're all asking is, I've got reduced revenue, how do I balance book? How do I still deliver services? Yes, same problem, but it's very uniquely different for every community. It could be because you're a small community or you're a large community. It could be because different parts of your services are more impacted. It could be due to unique circumstances facing your community. With that, I thought I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole, who's gonna broadly speak to some unique Nova Scotia issues. Uh, thanks, Sanjay. So uh, as part of the presentation, Sanjay had asked that I touch on you know, some of the issues that we think are, you know, I'll say close to home um, here in Nova Scotia. And, and so upon reflection, I think, you know, everybody on this call probably would acknowledge that, you know, many municipal governments have been begging, I think is probably the word that we, we often hear for aid for months. Um, we've been hearing um, warnings of finances careening towards a brick wall. Many city revenue streams have dried up as, as Sanjay would have just referenced. So whether that be from recreation centers and programming being closed, transit riders not using public transit anymore, and in April, the Canadian Federation of Municipalities indicated that cities alone are facing between 10 and $15 billion shortfalls due to a loss of revenue from property taxes, utility charges, and utility fees. Uh, so the COVID reality that we're now facing has caused many municipalities to have to recast their budgets and give their current services and spending a sober second look. Uh, in Nova Scotia, I think we all know that pre even pre-COVID, um, many municipalities were under a lot of pressure. Citizens and businesses alike are expecting more and more from you with a higher degree of service, while also expecting you to hold the line on taxes. Commerce has seen a trend of closing down, and especially in many of our rural municipalities, or seeing those businesses move closer towards city centers. Uh, so commercial tax rolls have also been suffering. Uh, recently, it was announced that the federal government would be putting about $2 billion towards the operating costs of Canadian municipalities for a period of six to eight months, um, requiring provinces and territories to match that amount from their own funds. In Nova Scotia, it's been determined that $250 million will be earmarked for municipalities. 
So aside from some of the obvious, what are some of the other things that we're hearing from our clients that they're experiencing um, in, in the current environment? So we've seen a deferral of tax payments. So many, not all, but many municipalities in Nova Scotia made the decision in early days of COVID uh, to defer uh, the requirement to pay taxes. Um, additionally, because of the decline in revenue from items such as public transit, recreation and fees and, and parking, this has created some pressures. Um, you have been impacted in your ability to provide service or meet you know, what some would you know, argue are minimum expectations and you've had to reduce your capital expenditures. Uh, I think a really good example of that and one that you know, personally hits close to home is you know, in Halifax, we've seen the transition of summer green bin pickup, transition from the every week that we're accustomed to seeing in the summer to every other week because of the cost pressures that we're experiencing. Um, and as a result, the province has indicated they will be offering loans to municipalities on a three year 1.1% term. Another issue that seems to be a really hot topic in the last little while is the concept of electronic municipal elections. Uh, although met with opposition from some, the province has been frankly unequivocal in their stance that municipal elections will be proceeding as planned in October with no delays. Uh, as a result, the traditional form of voting, uh, visiting a designated polling station in person to cast a vote, likely is going to be challenged because of our COVID reality. Uh, we know that many municipalities are already in the process of approving motions to allow for electronic or whether it be online or telephone voting this fall uh, as a means to keep citizens safe. Another topic that we hear a lot about is rural broadband. And I think, you know, in Nova Scotia, we would have heard a lot about this before. And certainly um, with the, the uh, mass exodus of people out of a workplace into a working from home arrangement, I think certainly the concept of rural broadband certainly gained some increased, I'll say, profile in the province. So we know that many communities have complained for years about slow, spotty, or frankly, sometimes non-existent high-speed internet. Um, this has arguably hampered business opportunities in many small communities um, and can present challenges from an education perspective for our students. So as people look to work, engage, socialize, and educate in new and different ways, access to reliable and cost-effective internet is going to be really important. As well, there's the concept of regional collaboration. We know that this is happening in many municipalities and, and many groups of municipalities across the province. Uh, for smaller municipalities, it's not always reasonable to expect that they can, you know, bring forward um, all of the services and support and infrastructure that people are expecting. So looking for increased opportunities to collaborate across municipalities is certainly um, something that continues to gain some traction. And last but not least, uh, you know, certainly um, we'd be remiss if we did not mention uh, pandemic planning for phase for wave two. Uh, you know, by all accounts, it's not a matter of if, but when. And as a result, we know many, many organizations, including yourselves, are starting to think, what does that second wave look like? So that really is just a bit of a snapshot of at least some of the things that we know are front of mind. We could probably have a whole webinar about just what the issues are, but we thought those were a few that we just would choose to highlight today. So Sanjay, back to you. Think. Great. Or no, yeah. Ricky. Yeah, we're going to move into the cases and we're starting with Ricky Sony on one there too. Sure, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Sanjay mentioned, my name is Ricky Sony. I'm based here in our Edmonton, Alberta office. So big morning to everyone, a bit of an earlier morning for me. Um, and I've been working with municipalities across Canada for about a decade, uh, being with the firm for about six years and previous to that, another firm. So municipalities are near and dear to my heart and I have an uh, utmost respect for all individuals and elected officials who work in a municipal context because I know it's not all as easy. So what I'll be uh, speaking today, to you today is about a viability study we performed for a regional municipality in Nova Scotia just last year. And I'll go through uh, the slide now. So essentially what was going on with this municipality was uh, they're really interested in having an external party assess their future viability. So there was uh, quite a bit going on just from an economic development perspective uh, with population declines you know, which is quite common throughout uh, municipalities in Nova Scotia. 
And uh, the, the real question was, what is the feasible level of taxations that can be applied to the community members to generate enough funds for services, but also continuing to provide a, a high level of service from the municipality to the, to the residents and businesses there. So what we did was we really undertook this engagement through three large phases. The first one was to really appreciate the current state of the issues facing the municipality. Uh, as Nicole mentioned, all municipalities are, are quite unique, but there are some commonalities across. At the same time, we need to acknowledge that there was quite a large historical context and drivers that drove the current state and to acknowledge that and to bring that front of center to ensure all the stakeholders involved and in this case the province was also involved uh, to appreciate those, those core issues so everything and we looked at the tax structure the impact of the cap program in nova scotia for example and what that had to do for municipal taxation revenues was a huge consequence for this municipality and also the impact of population declines like i mentioned we also did a comparative analysis as I mentioned, there's some best practices and that's why you're all here today is to learn from, from us and from each other. So we did some jurisdictional scans with four other municipalities, perhaps ones that may have gone through a bit of a transition of population decline to coming out the other end and bringing in some lessons learned and some best practices. Uh, alongside that, we also did a value for money analysis and an infrastructure deficit analysis. So the value for money analysis took a look at the municipal programs and how they were in fact providing value to the residents and the businesses within the jurisdiction of the municipality. And then of course on, on the infrastructure deficit, that's huge, right? Municipalities are, are really responsible for the maintenance and the development of water infrastructure, you know, on the wayside, there's infrastructure there on the utilities, and then also just roads these are these are huge costs when we look at recreation centers etc the list goes on so we really want to look at what exactly was an infrastructure deficit because that's a huge category of costs for the municipality bundling all that uh, what we did is we really were able to provide some recommendations along with the implementation plan for the municipality so our recommendations were really bucketed into three broad categories so the first was recommendations within the strategic category. So in this one, just to give you a bit of an example, we were looking at the opportunity to look at the tax regime within the downtown core to ensure an incentivized development there. We were looking at operational recommendations to, to look at potential partnerships with the private sector. Again, municipalities themselves take a lot on themselves, but there's opportunities to partner, uh, whether it's with institutions such as the university or whether it's with not-for-profit groups as well. And then policy related. So how can we make business easier to be undertaken within the municipality? How can we cut a red tape essentially and shift the autonomy more on the, on the private sector and on the business side of things to just encourage economic development? One thing that I think was really well received in this project was the detailed implementation plan. So certainly when a consultant does a study, it's a huge lift, but we really want to ensure that all of our projects don't just sit on a shelf. So we really provide a implementation plan with very tangible actions to be taken, a bit of a checklist, if you will, that a municipality can follow to ensure that it's, in this case, the viability of the municipality will remain strong and it'll be strengthened. And just to kind of take a step back and relaying this into the COVID situation that you're all facing today, uh, one really big lesson learned for us is talking about the reasonable level of service that a municipality provides its constituents. Uh, oftentimes, as Nicole said, this is now an opportunity to revisit what is a reasonable level of service and, and whether that makes sense for a municipality. And the question of you know, why a municipality is offering a service comes to light and the real value behind that. And that's something that I would encourage, uh, you know, all of you are already thinking about it, but there's some certain steps involved in that type of analysis that we can certainly assist you with. And uh, just to kind of take a step back to ensure that your core services are provided in a, in a great reasonable level of service, while those ancillary services where you think, hey, you know what, I maybe don't need to provide this level of service anymore because there's other private sector proponents to, that are now available that may not have otherwise been available in the past to provide the service, uh, that, that came to light here. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back on.
Oh, well, Sanjay, I think you just put me on mute. Sorry about that. So very uh, COVID remember the mute button. Um, I'm getting it into a case on a municipality that was looking for a program and service review. So first let's look at the client challenge. So a bit of background, large community facing already economic change. So uh, there were industries leaving, uh, there were new emerging industries, but in a sense, it was a, it was a community or economic zone that was trying to reinvent itself. And, and the city realized that. And what I mean by the city is they also had, uh, their council was probably 50% veteran councillors, been around a long time, and 50% newly elected councillors. And there were a lot of thoughts and opinions on how do we move the city strategy to suit also helping the community and working with business and the charity not-for-profit sector for building a great community. The administration, uh, an excellent administrative team looking to do things. They hadn't looked at their services and programs for about 20 years. So we started this in 2019 and we were about halfway through and then COVID hit as well. So we also pivoted and that was a decision again between council, administration, us as an advisor taking part in their solution and we had to pivot. So that was the challenge. Uh, what is the best kind of things we can do to help the community and then COVID overlapped into it. The solution that they brought to the table and they engaged us on was we want you to take a look at about 150 of our programs and services. And that represented about 50 to 55% of their services and programs. They had a few specialist providers looking at some other services and programs and we were coordinating with them as well so they can get a, a holistic picture and bucket recommendations. Our role in it was to be very third party, bring in certain specialists and start going at a high level. So we put it against it a discipline that was partially quantitative. So how do we look at quantitative information like, like budgets and reports and past information? Qualitative, so again, interviews with key leaders across their municipality because those people on the ground have frontline experience. They bring a lot to the table. And so the solution that with council admin we're working out was how do we extract that frontline knowledge and experience? And then also public engagement, because at the end of the day, you're representing a community. So to move things through your community, your residents want to feel that they're represented. And so we did um, public surveying, we had public tables. That was again, a solution that working with the city, we're, we're scrambling to put something in there that really gets that stakeholder engagement, but move quickly. And we bucketed recommendations into about 10 programs and services where we thought we want to go deeper. Now, where did we come out at the end? Well, on the conclusion, the one thing I'd like to say is first, we pivoted with COVID-19. So we had to then refocus a bit in terms of looking at the strategic plan that had been developed in 2019 and advising changes on where to put that. What really came out of it was to leverage some technology and also get certain areas of the city more involved on the front end of strategic planning, specifically uh, human resource planning and the IT group. And in terms of leveraging technology, we're looking at areas where we could drive still excellent services, but create technologies that help you extract more efficiency. And I'll mention um, three areas. One was water metering. So based on looking at uh, success with uh, the city of Toronto on water metering, um, there was a recommendation about taking a look at that as an initiative. The second was that in the strategic plan to get human resources and IT involved on the front end to actually work out, well, what do we need to do vis-a-vis -vis our people plan to put strategic initiatives in place and get them done in a timely way, a controlled way, in a way that actually enables the people on our team to do these special projects, but at the same time be able to do their regular jobs. And then the IT team, of course, they're, they're good at a broad set of IT, but how do we use those teams to engage with third party specialists? Other areas notable was um, looking at uh, technology for fleets. So when you're looking at assets like um, buses and cars, how do you use technology to program things like optimization of routes, optimization of drivers, uh, getting into hardware elements like optimization, optimization of gas usage. Another area to look at was uh, technology for management of city assets and facilities. So that was, I think, in the sense of an area where there was opportunity. Um, outcomes that was good on it was there was also a sense of creating um, 
a, a kind of a, a body of knowledge around the issue that counselors, uh, council, uh, uh, administration, uh, the mayor, and then also senior managers across the organization can collectively get a broader sense of the overall problems that the city was tackling and looking at the opportunities. The other big, I think, benefit was that it was public document and it involved getting a lot of the public perception. And so there was a lot of learning uh, by the uh, entire team about how the public perceived services. Some of that perception uh, opened up opportunities where communication could be improved um, and also opened up areas where maybe the public had really good insights about where to look further to uh, leverage services further and or prioritize certain services. So I think that that was a sense of kind of a, a broader dive leading to specific areas. There was about 40, 45, I think, uh, opportunities listed. Um, then there was also a collaboration on developing what we thought were the top 10. And when I say we, I mean the council, uh, the administration, and us as advisors. So again, you know, cities know, they know what they're doing. There's a lot of experience there. Uh, our job was to bring in some specialized areas and collaboratively working on solutions uh, made a lot of sense. So I think that's all I've, I've got to say on this case. It was very interesting and um, it, it was good for, for an organization that hadn't looked broadly to engage in something like this. I'll move it now to Nicole. Uh, thanks, Sanjay. So I'm just going to touch briefly on uh, an assignment that we worked on a couple of years ago related to municipal dissolution and amalgamation. And so, you know, this is a topic certainly that has been at the forefront of uh, the discussions and, and the minds of many people in the municipal space. Um, and certainly one that is, you know, continuing even today. Uh, so we were working, we were engaged uh, to work with a rural municipality or a municipality outside of the HRM um, who had made an application to the UARB to dissolve the town and transfer its operations and resources to one of a number of potential uh, municipalities in the area. So they had identified, you know, a variety of solutions uh, that they were interested in considering as part of the dissolution process. Um, so this uh, um, concept was prompted because the town was facing financial challenges and it was deemed that they were insurmountable with the current governance structure. Uh, so we were engaged um, to facilitate a financial and social study to understand the impact of each of the options that had been identified by the town. And I think one of the things that was interesting about this um, dissolution, dissolution and amalgamation assignment was that it not only was um, intending to undertake an, an understanding of the financial implication, uh, the town really had a strong desire to understand the social impact of the solutions, um, which was a little bit of a different slant uh, than some of the other dissolution work that we had done in the past. So from a financial perspective, the approach was to gather information from each of the relevant municipal units, compile it into a variety of financial projections and interpret the results. From a social perspective, what we were engaged to do was work with um, 10 key community groups and associations to gain an understanding both of their current relationship with the town, um, concerns that they had uh, related to the dissolution proposal, um, and as well understand the nature of that, um, you know, the support, whether it was financial or otherwise, that these community groups and associations were receiving because of their relationship with the town. And then lastly, uh, for a period of one week, residents uh, during this process were given an opportunity to respond to an online survey that was administered by us to help us gain some insight and perspective on the concerns that they had about the, the proposal, uh, the service levels that they were receiving or potentially could be receiving, and what they viewed as the most important community assets in the process. So from a conclusion perspective, um, on the financial side, we identified that there were a few key areas that were going to be impacted by the potential solutions. So we identified the impact on residential and commercial tax rates, the debt service costs as a percentage of own source revenue, and the required infrastructure investment that would be necessary in the next five years post dissolution, regardless of the solution that was entertained. From a social perspective, we identified what the key community assets were perceived to be, the nature of their relationship and the synergies with potential neighboring municipalities. 
uh, and as well um, understand their concerns with respect to the proposal. Um, as well, through the work that we did, we were able to identify or at least get a bit of a, a temperature check on the degree of community awareness related to the proposal that had been put forward to the UARB um, and their understanding of the options and why those options were deemed necessary. Um, so this provided an opportunity for the town to kind of incorporate um, on their go forward plans, um, both um, considerations of what, what residents felt were incredibly important within the community and as well um, address some of the lack of, you know, the, the disconnect in the, the awareness of the, of the solution that was being put forward um, so that they could better inform people and people would hopefully be more, you know, engaged and buy into the process. So we thought that one would be an interesting one to raise because I think it was a bit of a different uh, slant on a typical dissolution process, the concept of engaging with key community groups and residents. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it back over to Sanjay. Thank you. Oh, Sanjay, I think you're on mute again, sorry. Sorry about that folks, but again, we're, we're talking about now, how do we build your response plan? And per the next slide, how do you move from survive to thrive? And so actually on the, the next slide, what we tried to do is just put a simple bucket of a framework. So this is gonna get circulated. And, and um, uh, my thought is that this is a sheet that can be torn away, put on a wall. And when you're looking at uh, how do we potentially build response plans. I think there's five areas to look at. Organization redesign, uh, technology and operations improvement, sourcing financing, recovery planning, and third-party collaboration management. So when you're looking at some of your challenges, which are listed on the bottom, so for example, decline in tax revenue and or with a decline in tourism, uh, less dollars coming in, you might look at, at sourcing uh, financing solutions. And that could include um, a number of different areas. And I've got a, a sense of some cities that we're talking to are considering divesting assets uh, to raise money. Controversial, but still a source of financing. Another area is looking at analysis for further revenue sources. Uh, Ricky's leading a number of different projects uh, which have to do with cost analysis. Oftentimes, costing and sort of the methodologies for costing have been done the same way for many years. And by re-looking at that, there may be ways to actually figure out where there's actually more money available. The other thing is acting as a body together in terms of maintaining lobbying and accessing, you know, the province and federal governments and, and seeing what they're doing and seeing if there's places to grab more money there, that, that's another area. If you look at areas like um, long-term planning and sustainability, I think technology uh, and operations improvement is a big area to go to. Uh, online services. So whereas residents might be walking into buildings and doing things, can they access it online and get it done remotely? Uh, can you automate certain types of services and processes? And then on the process side of it, process mapping. Those are areas where I think you can leverage for greater sustainability and, and long-term planning. Uh, we have a city actually that is, is going into, we, we did a services review and we're kicking off a new project two weeks ago helping them in the area of organization redesign. So they're dealing with a hiring freeze right now. And they're saying, well, how can we get our people to end up doing more without actually doing more? And that has to do with efficiency. So they're looking at creating strategic business plans by department and then attaching that uh, objectives to that business plan and performance metrics for the department. And then working with their managers, the idea is to create as well performance metrics and, and management objectives by person in those departments for their 2020, 2021 goals. So that people actually know, look, my material objectives are maybe these top three or four things, helps people focus. And also in the process, they're hoping to catch duplication. So understand where potentially there might be two or three people that are looking at the same piece of work uh, a number of times. And if they can reduce that, they get more efficiency people can still maintain their hours, but end up doing a little bit more. In terms of third-party collaboration management, a good example would be looking at garbage collection. Again, controversial, but sometimes some communities are considering having that outsourced. And so there may be outsourcing solutions where you're using the private sector, uh, social enterprise, or engaging your cities in volunteerism to help provide solutions. So I thought I'd try to speak to the slide with some examples. Uh, I know this 
decks going across and hopefully there's something there that can help you prompt ideas while you're whiteboarding different things to do. On the next slide, we actually just uh, bucketed some practical tips. So by practical, I mean looking at things that require analysis and thinking versus going out and spending. And so the top four we thought we'd put forward was one, that organization redesign. So do you have the right people in the right seats on your bus? Do you have too many people in those seats doing the same thing where it could be one person versus three people? And can you look at departments and maybe move around some services in a variety of ways in your structure that leads to a greater communication and therefore a greater efficiency? Something that has to do with just sitting around the table with your very smart people in your organization, because uh, you got smart people in all these organizations who are caring and care about your communities and just going and saying, hey, can we do some things better? Well, the second piece is cost analysis. I spoke to it earlier. Uh, Ricky's been driving a number of projects to just kind of, hey, are there better ways we can look at costs? Are there costs we don't understand completely? And you know, it just gives you a sense of, do we have the control over our, our financials or inputs, things going on? Can we get greater control and certainty? And on that, have an ability to, uh, to, to be able to leverage more of our dollars. The third bucket, management by objectives and key performance indicators. Um, it's been used in a variety of different sectors, but it's, it's really in simplicity, it's about giving clear markers for people to understand what are their most important things to do. And that helps them make choices uh, towards things that suit organizational objectives. And it, it, it takes away confusion and it also creates for very objective conversations that are based around something that everyone's agreed to and can, can measure against. Uh, finally, it's appropriate use of technology. There are lots of technologies out there. So the word appropriate means not going necessarily looking even for new technology, but looking at your existing technology and saying, are we actually leveraging this as best we can? Because you'll see oftentimes organizations have some great technology, which is under leveraged. And so there's an ability to drive more efficiency just on what you have. And then in terms of appropriate use of technology, uh, looking to your IT departments on the front end saying, we're thinking of doing X. This is a strategic objective, but we want to get input on the front end as to what might have technology might help us get there. And then also given our budgets, you know, is that a good spend or not? Uh, the last thing with technology is to be mindful of not getting oversold on technology. Um, if there are technologies that you're approaching on using that you're unfamiliar with, um, make sure you have the right experts at, at your disposal from your internal teams or external with helping you make sure that you're not being sold something that, yes, it may have value in five or 10 years, but it's not going to give you immediate value. And based on your overall holistic budget, the spend's not appropriate. So those are some practical tips that we thought would be uh, useful. Again, uh, hopefully it's something that can help or there's some tidbits in here that are useful for people listening in. Uh, at this point, I think we just uh, open up to, uh, to questions and we're, we're very happy to uh, be here. Thank you very much to all three of you for uh, the presentation. There's some really good takeaways there, I think, for, uh, for our, our participants and, and also um, they can get in touch with you to build on some of those uh, initiatives uh, if they want to within their own their own municipalities. So if people have questions, um, they're more than happy to answer. So we can get you to type them into the chat. If you don't mind, if anyone has anything that they want to ask our presenters today. Maybe to get it rolling, we, we had some great questions from some prior presentations we've done over the across the country. And one was what should municipalities do to lean on the federal government for assistance due to COVID-19. And maybe I'll open up to, to Ricky on some thoughts uh, on that um, to share. Yeah, as Nicole mentioned, uh, you know, municipalities across the country are, are really requesting assistance from the federal government. And there has actually been some recent announcements that funding is going to provinces to then go into municipalities. But we did think about this question and there's a few things to consider. So first was just as Sanjay had it earlier slide is to quantify the impact of COVID on the municipality. So in other words, tracking those revenue declines. So that story could be shared and told to actually understand what the impact has been on your municipality. So I thought that's really important. Everything from deferred taxation to simply an elimination of revenues. 
you know, the second part of that is really creating a unified voice, particularly in Nova Scotia. Uh, it's really great to see all the collaboration that occurs. So every community is impacted differently. But the idea is to really create um, a unified voice for this very systemic issue that that's really occurring as part of COVID. And then also acknowledging, you know, for a municipality, what's under your control. Um, so track the actions that you've already taken because higher orders of government in our experience really want to understand what you've already done and also acknowledge what's outside of your control. But there's a couple other things. I'll pass it over to Nicole as well, just to kind of clarify some additional points that we felt were important here. Uh, thanks, Ricky. So I think uh, one of the things that I that I would add, just kind of on your last point about what's what's in your control, I think yeah, we we've we've already seen municipalities in Nova Scotia start to think creatively about the things that they need to do in response to COVID. So I mean, I use the I'll say a simple example. I mean, simple but still you know impactful uh, decision to transition green cart pick from weekly to bi-weekly. As well, we've seen another local municipality in the province uh, transition to piloting four-day work weeks in response to COVID as we start to think about what does this mean for the future. Um, so I think, you know, one of the positive things, you know, being, you know, in the local market is we are starting to see people think creatively um, in response to what the current environment is, you know, forcing us to do. Um, so I think, you know, a couple other things that I would add is that it's really important to, you know, be communicating with your stakeholders so that they understand what's going on and what kind of support you need. Um, and it helps manage expectations along the way. And I think it's really important as well to be really clear with whatever that ask is, it needs to be well understood by the recipient of the ask. So, you know, being able to demonstrate how that potential funding would be used, what you're going to do to create some positives, you know, whether it's employment or spinoffs in the community, I think are also really important. We do have a comment actually in the chat saying you just mentioned a real issue money to municipalities from feds having to go through the province mm -hmm. and it, it's very interesting because you know it's complex with money and funding and so there's that interrelationship municipal provincial federal um, but again that unified voice um, case in point nsfm having a voice and and powerfully pushing sort of the the, the issues of municipalities as a uniform group uh, will get ears and action. Um, to that point, in other space, the CNPO world, some of the largest CNPOs formed a lobby group, you know, and on that lobby group, it did lead to movement by the federal government to release some funding, not as much as what they wanted, but that uniform uh, voice again was able to speak very powerfully to the number of jobs affected, which was at about 10%. They spoke to their fears and concerns that there could be layoffs in that space in the area of 100 to 200,000 people. And, you know, that started moving the conversation up to the point that, you know, it got national focus in Globe and Mail and national papers. So it becomes something that uh, gets ears. So I think, again, one voice versus collective voices is, um, is very different. And, and then in the complexities of the funding and between different areas, that, that, that's, uh, uh, again, voices get, get attention. So I don't know if that helps um, deal with that question. I don't know if there's other, um, is there another question? Maybe before then some things we're seeing, uh, we have actually small communities. So what are small communities doing? There's actually a, a couple of small communities that we're dealing with right now who they're looking at just analyzing, not even making a decision, on whether they should merge their communities. So in merging their communities, would they get uh, leveraging on services? Would it help bring down property taxes? And what they're doing is they're going through a, a complex set of analysis. Um, they're, we're, we're engaged more to help them with some public stakeholder engagement to get voices at the table from residents and also in that particular area, their First Nation groups. And then run through an analysis over the next three, four months and, and, and then uh, weigh in on whether that might be something to do or not do. Similarly, in small communities, uh, there's a string of small communities that we were dealing with last year, Ricky and I were dealing with, where there's a, a number of services, including water, that were shared. And so it was a sense of looking at, you know, in terms of looking at their, their budgeting and planning in and around water, water rates design, things like that. 
those are things that that small communities are looking at. Well, hey, how can we plan better? And looking at the the impact of COVID nineteen, some of the unpredictable Im impacts. You know, how do we plan better at looking at, at, at a few areas of, like that? So that is something that I think uh, are things that we're seeing small communities do. We're also currently engaged with another community where we're having further talks with the mayor and clerk next week, where they're looking at um, a financial management practices review. Ricky, did you want to speak to that? Because I know you've, you've dealt with a number of different projects in that area, and it's helpful for small communities. Yeah, I mean, what Sanjay's referring to here is that uh, on the financial management practices, are there policies in place that are being followed? And what's really interesting is that in further conversations, it, things bubble up to the surface, right, when we have third parties involved. And in this circumstances, we started with the financial management side, and that would, had quite a boundary around it, but really bubbled up to the culture of the municipality as well. Sanjay, where we were talking to them and they were saying, hey, you know what, this is great, but when we have meetings around our tables, our staff don't voice their opinions. And as a result, we, we don't know where to go. So that just allows us to actually take a bit of a capital management spin as well to say, not only are your financial management, perhaps policies need to be more robust or you need to have additional policies in place, everything from your reserve management to how you approach fraud and cybersecurity, but also around how you ensure people have an opportunity to also voice improvements from within, not just the external party uh, facilitating that. So I think that project is going to really lead to some interesting changes within their organization to ensure that all the horsepower that they have internally is really well utilized. I, th I think too, um, I, would, I would just add, I think if you, if you look at uh, the mandate of NSFM, both from a collaboration and an advocacy perspective, I mean, the, the, a lot of the things that we've just talked about are really closely aligned with both the mandate of the organization and work I think that we know that has already been done in the province so you know I think it, it's just a testament to you know the impact that organizations like this and the collective voice can have um, you know NSFM was really instrumental I think in doing some of that financial analysis and advocating to the province and the feds to get that funding uh, for municipalities within the province that was so desperately needed so so I think this is a really great example of of, of the I'll say the gears at work in making that happen that's a great point Nicole I, I think to like having Nicole here and it's doubling down that, you know, this is a people affecting problem. So COVID-19 is creating unique stresses never before seen on, on, on people. So that includes the people working for your cities and municipalities. That includes your council members. That includes your administration. That includes yourself. And so there's got to be a level of empathy and a people approach to looking at it. And the expectations have to be realistic too on the planning to take that into account. And Nicole, I, I'm wondering if you can maybe provide some comment on some of that sort of COVID-19 pressure on people. Uh, sure, Sanjay. I mean, I think, you know, we've seen, um, you know, there, there's there been a lot of challenges that organizations, I think, have faced, I mean, whether it's, you know, a municipality or a privately held business. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time talking to our clients about is about the impact on people uh, and how we cannot underestimate the impact that this has had and, and how it is really important as I think leaders uh, to acknowledge some of those mental health aspects and you know yes aside from the, the physical work itself and where you're performing the work is that the concept of this has been you know a significantly stressful time for many people and some people in very different ways whether it be from trying to manage navigating having a full-time job and also being a full-time school teacher to one or more children um, to caring for people that might be at risk to their own individual fears about you know catching COVID-19 so I think it's really important as leaders that we think about how we can support our people um, recognizing people are going to respond in different ways. Thanks Nicole. If I can just jump in, my name is uh, Bill Mills. I'm the mayor of the town of Truro. Um, we are the largest town in the province of Nova Scotia. Um, 
some of it, I agree with many of the things that have been expressed this morning. I, I will say that uh, even before COVID-19, towns in Nova Scotia were consider, uh, facing considerable challenges. Uh, you being with Grant Thornton, I'm sure you're familiar with some of the CFIs for a number of municipal units in the province. Uh, the towns for a long time have been uh, pushing for fair and equitable funding. And uh, certainly uh, the playing fields between rural and urban are so, so far apart. Uh, I'll give you a quick uh, example. Uh, I, uh, a town of the, about 13,000, we pay $5 million a year for our policing, whereas a county would pay about 30%, 70% that being subsidized by the federal government through the RCMP. Uh, I'm responsible for 100% of my roads where the province of Nova Scotia looks after a large percentage of the rural roads. And I never would expect the county to be responsible for 100% of the roads because they are rural and the list goes on. One of the things, if you look at the CFIs, you'll see the uh, differences between uh, reserves and what the towns have and what the counties have and, and, and the expectations by the province, for example, of what is a uh, correct number you should have for your reserves. That's a big challenge for a town to keep our reserves at the levels expected by the province. So we, we sometimes and many times feel that uh, we're somewhat being squeezed out. Uh, and uh, in many cases, uh, perhaps amalgamation is the only uh, um, alternative. There's another thing. We, uh, the former mayor of Colchester and I always used to talk about uh, instead of amalgamation, there's an alternative called cooperation. And we've done a good job on that, uh, sharing services and so on and so forth. So um, what COVID has done is certainly, uh, and I don't have to explain that much to you, you know, uh, you're on the front lines as well. Uh, it's just uh, amplified uh, the problems that we are facing as a town. And I, I, did, I did like something that was mentioned earlier about a review of all of our services. Um, and what we provide, why are we providing it, and perhaps maybe how we should change that. So um, uh, I just wanted to throw that, those comments in that uh, uh, it is a challenging time for small towns. And um, you know certainly the difference, uh, not as much today as it used to be, but tax rates between a town versus uh, just across the river in Truro, to Bible Hill and Colchester County, um, that's where many people go and they will live there because they save on taxes, but the service delivery uh, is not the same out there as far as water. In, in this case around here, we probably have uh, on a per capita basis more fire service uh, brigades than probably anybody else in any city across the country. We're talking millions of dollars of equipment. And so for a population in the, the whole county, including for all 50,000 people, you'd have 14 brigades or more. So, you know, we, we, we wrestle with this all the time. They deal with that through an area rate. Uh, we deal with that, we have to have a uh, full-time fire service, a uh, composite service, if you will, and it's not getting any cheaper. So I just throw those things in there for considerations as to when you uh, look at the future for COVID. Uh, certainly um, our staff, uh, senior staff, certainly have their eyes on that. And uh, just before I came up here, we have an outdoor pool and we put tenders out for a new pool lining. And that we were expecting the cost to be about $175,000 for that and all the work included. We find out today that they, they, the tender is about 275,000 and that's for a low bid. And there are only two people that bid. So those are some of the challenges that we're dealing with, but I hear you loud and clear and our strategic planning process, uh, we're really diving in deep look at how we can change the way we do things. So thanks for listening. Bill, thanks for the comments and really appreciate it. And, you know, it, it did reiterate a point we started with that the challenges and solutions are things that we think that municipalities have been facing for years, uh, particularly smaller communities. And then COVID just puts an added pressure. And a lot of the solutioning is it's kind of like lifting the hood of the of a car engine and first looking for what actually is not working as best possible in the car. So not buying anything new, but just what do we have that can work better? And then working on improving that, fully understanding and, and moving forward. But it can't be you know, like a business approach. It's not just about efficiency. It's about rolling out great services. It's about 
uh, maintaining the health and wellness of your, your uh, employees who work and provide those services for your communities. And, and it's about also taking account that, you know, there's some things like water policy right now where you got to pay attention on how, what's the impact going to be on your, your poorest uh, people in your community. Um, single moms. Absolutely. Yeah. So that those are very unique and, and interesting. And, you know, the communities we're dealing with too, like it's, it's across the country. The community we're talking to is, is less than 5,000 people this week. The community looking at, at potentially bringing their communities together, you're talking about 2,000 people per community. Uh, well, the water if I, studies. If I could just add to that. Absolutely. What, no, yeah, absolutely. One, of the, one of the things that's very tough is, of course, the federal regulations on water, okay? Yeah. And uh, we know in Atlantic Canada right now through the Atlantic Mayor's Congress, uh, if some of those uh, uh, regulations are implemented and some of them are already, most towns in rural Newfoundland and uh, elsewhere, uh, they're facing bankruptcy based on that very policy. And and some of our people on staff in the water department feel that those standards are way too high, uh, more than what's really needed, okay? In Truro, we're fortunate that through collaboration with Colchester County, we do have a wastewater treatment facility. We do have a water treatment plant in town, and that's credit to the former administration before I came on board about uh, 35 years ago. So, so yeah, but uh, those are the things we're struggling with. And of course, the announcement by the federal government on the deficit for this year, and then the province of Nova Scotia's announcement on the deficit as of COVID-19. Man, oh man, I tell you, um, the hairs are getting a little more grayer every day. So anyway. No, Bill, appreciate it. Ricky, did you want to comment anything to the words water? Because you just finished an interesting project there, right? Yeah, I don't think Bill hit it on the head. Uh, in the past, you know, the policeman or woman would fill the pothole and run the water treatment plant. There would be a lot of generalists in smaller municipalities, but regulations, and, and that came up in our viability study for Nova Scotia. That is, that, that is impacting quite a bit across the province. And I think it just comes down to the level of risk. And the analogy is, is that many municipalities, and this is of course imposed upon you folks, but it also comes bottom up, Bill, in terms of how some jurisdictions have a level of risk in place. For example, development services where permits need to be taken place before developments can occur. We've seen really innovative solutions. Now is an opportunity to change for some municipalities that have actually shifted that risk burden onto the private sector to say, we're, we're holding this accountability on towards you and we're just the backstop versus being the front stop. So there's some innovative approaches that are being taken there, but this is this is something that's tough. Well, I'll close with this, right, because I have to go, but um, I just attended a Tourism Nova Scotia meeting, TNs, yesterday, and um, the question came up to me because I was one of the few mayors there, but what are we doing to help tourism in our area? And it was point, the, uh, point blank put to me, uh, can I go to NSFM and ask if they will implement the same program in Nova Scotia that New Brunswick is. So if I'm a New Brunswicker and I stay in the province and spend a thousand dollars, will the province of Nova Scotia, for example, give me a thousand dollars if I stay in Nova Scotia? I haven't brought that before them yet. I, I'll do that later today. But you know, in light of the uh, deficit announcement yesterday, wow, where are we going to find that? And we can pull it from someplace, but it's going to mean some other service is going to suffer if we move that cash from A to B, okay? So those are the challenges that we have. So I wanna thank you for uh, uh, today. And for those of you out West, I have kids in Wetaskiwin and Sylvan Lake. So I'm sort of a borderline Albertan, okay? Huh. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I understand that the other information, this will be sent to us, uh, what's been presented today, is that correct? We'll have this posted up on the website for sure, Bill. And uh, also, I know Sanjay and, and Nicole and Ricky will be available to you, I'm sure, to reach out through email or calls for, okay. for anything that they might want to get involved with. Okay, so Judy and uh, Juanita, you heard my thing on the Nova Scotia tourism thing. Uh, I'm waiting for your letter. Okay, we'll go. Yeah. <laughs> heard you loud and clear. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye, Bill. Thanks, Bill. So on that, I think unless there's, uh, I mean, I'm sure we can stick around for a couple of minutes if, if their schedule is allowed, if anyone has any more comments or questions. Um, and if not, I think we're gonna, we're gonna try to keep on our schedule and, and wrap it up. So does anyone have anything further? Okay, I think we're good. So we wanna thank Sanjay and Nicole and Ricky 
uh, for all the time that you've put into the the presentation. It was excellent in my opinion. Uh, we will, as I said, we'll I'll get the PowerPoint presentation and we'll make sure that that's up on the website as well as the recording and we'll filter that out to our members. We do have several, I'm sure, who weren't able to make it today that will be uh, anxious to take a look at it. Um, and I think, uh, I think we're good to go. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you everyone Thank for you. attending. Take care all. <laughs>